imagine coming home and your parent isn't there? Can you imagine only hearing your mother's voice through a telephone and seeing her through thick glass? This documentary was created by youth with formerly incarcerated parents and is made to open up eyes and give back the voice that was once taken away. People don't seem to notice that young people didn't do the crime but yet face the biggest punishment of all of not having a parent to lean on. I didn't know what was going on. I just know that my father wasn't there. Out of nowhere, my mom didn't come home after work, so I just thought she was gonna come back the next day or something like that. I remember my, not seeing my mom for like a good week. Then it was the moving point. I didn't know what was going on. I was like six or seven and everything was moving too fast. I remember asking what happened and my dad looked really red and shaking a lot. And when I get back to my house, it's straight ransacked. Like they just, they tore up the whole house and I'm like, yo, what happened? My father um, moved back to Texas. We got in touch with his side of the family and they told us that he was in prison. My grandmother and my grandfather told me that she was working in Puerto Rico as a real estate agent. I go to the phone and it's my mom. I'm like, hi, how you doing? Why are you not here? How, you know, what's going on with this? And then she still didn't explain anything to me. Like two or three days later, my grandmother has her door closed. So I stood there and I heard everything, saying how they're trying to beat the case and blah, 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 how they're gonna give her this much time and all this other crap. And I'm just sitting there like, what? My mom had to do everything. That's what changed. I would say financially things changed a lot. I, could, I, I no longer had anything I wanted. So I had to adjust to that. We would have to take off our, our jackets and go through a metal scanner. And then we would go to this cell room where we would just talk to her. But I couldn't touch her because we were separated by a glass. All I knew is that I was going to see my father. You know, and my grandmother was sneaking chicken and um, macaroni and cheese in the visiting room. <laughs> and just, you know, being treated like a prisoner um, myself, um, not being treated with respect, not being spoken to with respect. You could not go and sit where the inmate was. They wouldn't allow you to because they probably thought that you was giving them something. Like, I think about that now, but when I was little, I didn't care. I just wanted to sit on my mom's lap and hug her. children are traumatized when their parents are arrested and then from what I've seen there's continual trauma. There are long horrible bus rides up to the Canadian border. Sometimes correction officers aren't so good to them. Most prisons are located in very rural areas very far away from where the majority of people are incarcerated and this is a phenomenon across the country. And then they go to school on Monday and the emotions are gonna show. And when children of divorce go to school on Monday and they act out, teachers say, oh dear, he was with his dad this weekend. But they never in a million years would say he shouldn't visit his dad. But when children of the incarcerated go to school and show their feelings, teachers, guidance counselors, and principals start to say, I don't think they should take her to visit that prison. The teachers are sending you home and tell you to get this song by your parents, that's when it occurred to me that my mom was really not there. Her parole officer would come and visit me in school in front of all the other kids. So um, they would know what was going on and they would start spreading rumors and laugh at me. It was part of my life for so long that it almost became normal. Where it wasn't like, oh, my parents are incarcerated, my dad's and my brother's incarcerated. It was like so normal. It was like we had family reunions in, in, um, in visiting rooms because it's like all the men in my family were locked up at one time. So I, I, re, I mean, I remember like, you know, feeling like, yo, I can't like all the men are gone. It wasn't until my junior year in college at UCLA when I went to visit him um, that he told me and my brother that his sentence was actually for life and that he wouldn't be getting out in a few years this time. I got suspended almost every single year for the same fighting reason. Um, I would just get, I get getting, getting picked on by my kid, by the kids in my class until I just exploded and hit.
hit somebody? I can honestly say I changed a lot. There was no little innocent kid anymore. I got abusive, put it that way. So when I used to play around with my niece, she used to hit me. I used to hit her back hard and I didn't know. I just hit her back and then she'd go cry to her moms. Last year I got involved with, with gangs and everything and I got assaulted in April where I was left really badly. One of my friends who, who blessed me in, he asked me, um, is there any specific reasons? I said, well, my mom's in jail and I have nobody to chill with. So yeah. My experience is that people have so many stereotypes about prison and about who's in prison. And it's really good for those kids not to see those mothers and fathers anymore. And they're just a bad influence and we gotta save them. I mean, we've seen evidence that shows that family engagement while a person's incarcerated or shortly after returning from prison um, is a way to reduce the recidivism rate. Um, so the idea that we don't do that or we don't see that as an evidence-based practice really takes me, you know, I'm taken aback by it. My personal experience over 30 years is that almost all of the children I've worked with, that is true for that staying connected to their incarcerated parent maximizes their supports and minimizes the trauma. It was the greatest time of my life. I went to go pick her up. I'm jumping around, holding her hand. When she came, I was the first one who jumped on her and I gave her a hug. Everybody was crying like little babies and I was just smiling and I started laughing. To be able to spend that, that, that time, wake up in the morning, go to sleep with my, you know, with my brother is and stuff like that, my sister, so it was a great time for me. It made me feel good that, you know, I finally have somebody to do the same thing that they did, pick me up from school, you know, hug and get bothered by. When she came home, I learned how to control my anger issues. Um, when somebody said something about my mother, I would just say that I didn't like that and I would walk away. And now as an adult, I um, make it down to Texas once a year to visit. After I um, finish visiting, I go to the car, the rental car, <laughs> and I just ball for an hour. I can't even drive. I just go to the car and I just like let it all out. I don't want to you know, cry that much in front of my dad because I know that it would really hurt him. So I just have this period of grief. Um, having to leave him there and not being able to take him with me. That even if you think of this as a purely fiscal issue and you're thinking of how to leverage resources to get better outcomes, um, you're totally missing the ball by not engaging the family. It's a distance. Just stop putting people away from people's family. You're putting them that far away. What, what is the point in that? I would change the sentences. Try not to make it so long, like 10 years and up. We should be able to see our parents any time of the year for as long as we want during visiting hours. Just doing a little bit for people inside, drug rehab and college, makes an enormous difference in lives, their lives, their children's lives. If we really start focusing on raising the awareness of the people on the street, just general people, that people can be good parents and still make mistakes, commit crimes, do things that are wrong, have drug and alcohol addictions, and still be good parents. Um, that's a really, really important tool. This is frustrating, um, but at the same time, it's a source of motivation to educate others, to do all that I can to, to help stem this tide.